I'm Colin Irwin. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Liverpool. Um, I lived in Northern Ireland for 10 years and worked on the peace process there. And um, I work, and since working on the Northern Ireland peace process, I've been working around the world. Um, what I do is I do uh, public opinion polls and public diplomacy. Uh, but here's a slide first of all. The uh, National Centre for, uh, for Public Opinion has been tracking uh, people's attitudes to staying in the, in the European Union or leaving. And you can see that in 2015, 2016, 2015, only 22% wanted to leave or um, stay. But with, so it, Cameron saw these statistics in 2015 and thought he was going to walk a referendum and he called a referendum. And in 2016, it swung right around, and uh, we then got to 41% uh, leave. So he lost the referendum. Um, the reason why he lost the referendum is because nobody took account of ethnic politics and what in conflict resolution circles we call ethnic entrepreneurs. They, they're all over the place. They're all over the Balkans. They're in Kashmir. They're in Sri Lanka. These are people that play the ethnic card and use race relations or ethnic relations or religious uh, differences to advance their own political agendas. So um, what we ended up with then is basically two deeply divided societies. Uh, and I'm going to compare Northern Ireland with Catholics and Protestants and Brit Britain, which now has Remainers and Leavers. So what I did with the peace polls is um, I ran public opinion polls and find out what people could agree to. And they're very, very different to what's being done at present. At present, we've got uh, the Leave camp with hundreds of thousands of pounds spending money on public opinion polls, which are very biased towards their question of how, how, how we can leave. And then there's the guys with the Remain camp doing exactly the same thing. And then there's the government doing their polling, which is also very biased. But anyway, what we did in Northern Ireland uh, was we would involve the politicians, get them writing the questions, get them agreeing the questions, and then running the polls and doing a better job than anybody else so that ours became the voice of authority. Um, and then after, do, I ran nine polls in Northern Ireland, uh, and then since then I've been working in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, Kashmir, Sri Lanka, uh, Israel, Palestine, Sudan, Cyprus, Syria, but not in Brexit, and a, you'll, I'll try and explain why. In Northern Ireland, we ran these nine polls, and you can split the political issues in the negotiations into two blocks. And you'll see all this stuff repeating itself in the Brexit process. There are, there are uh, procedural questions, which in negotiation you might call the shape of the table questions. Who's going to sit where? Who's going to do what? How are decisions going to be made? And then there's the substantive questions, which is what's going to be in the agreement? Is it going to be more of this or more of that? And what's the relationship between the different states or the different sides, etc., etc. And so the first few polls were on procedural issues, and then we got into substantive issues, and then the last few polls were on implementation. And so that's kind of the history of how that all went through. But then there was a longer history to the whole Northern Ireland process. There was the Sunningdale Agreement, the Downing Street Declaration, and so on and so on. So this thing ran for years, and the, pr the whole process ran for years, and it was nothing like, and then we ended up with an agreement. Um, but this agreement was on the back of a great deal of research and a great deal of political uh, comings and goings. Then, so, the, these are my peace polls, and they were published in the Belfast Telegraph. So we, the, there was a whole public diplomacy campaign that was built around the public opinion research. So this is one of my polls, 77% say yes. Now when we ran, when it came actually to the referendum, it was only 71% say yes, so you might say, well Colin was 5% off. 
but we weren't because the DUP voted against the agreement and when you take the DUP vote out you come down to 71% so we were accurate give or take 1% um, and then we were running polls all the time the Ulster Unionists wanted to walk out of the uh, polls at one time and so we, we ran a poll um, and it said 65% of the Ulster Unionists still want to stay in so then they changed their mind and on the back of our poll stayed in the negotiations and didn't walk out of the negotiations. Um, the, 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 the Republicans, there was very little support in Northern Ireland for their particular agenda of a united Ireland and all that went with that. So it was a cruel thing to do but I had to run polls on that and actually Sinn Féin I said, well, I'm sorry, guys, but, you know, you're, there's, there's not many takers for your agenda. They said, that's okay, Colin. Uh, we, we need to publish this because we have to tell our own people that there's no takers for our agenda. So they were very constructively and in a very mature way using the public opinion polls to help work through to the Belfast Agreement. Um, and there might be some people in the... Brexiters who aren't using <laughs> public opinion polls and politics in quite such a sophisticated way. The same went for the loyalists. Um, they wanted to get their guys out of prison. Um, it was a part. It was part of the deal that they were going to get their guys out on on what's called on license. So if they're bad, they go back in again. Um, the public were totally against this, but they were going to get this in the agreement. So the loyalists were going to sign up for sure. There's a very young Tony Blair and a slightly younger me, because this is 20 years ago. Um, and uh, I guess I should rush on through this because I've only got 10 minutes. But we're keeping the, the British government, the Irish government on board. We want to keep the US State Department on board. And we want to keep the European community on board. So we was, you know, we've got a poll here saying 93% say still make the agreement work. This is when we're having trouble with implementation and we still wanted the, the support of the European Union. So that all worked out fine. But look, look at this, this is a headline in The Guardian, which is a liberal paper from a few days ago. That would never have happened in Northern Ireland. We, we would have managed the peace process and managed the public opinion, and we would never have got a headline like that. It just wouldn't have happened. Um, the, the management of the, of the Brexit process is totally incompetent. Um, <clears throat> so let me get into some uh, nuts and bolts here. There were eight options for Northern Ireland. They run from a separate Northern Ireland state, full incorporation to the British state, continued direct rule from London, power sharing uh, with the anglo Irish power sharing with North-South bodies, Actually, those north-south bodies to address your question about... I mean, nobody thought there was going to be a border. So the north-south bodies are written into the agreement. Well, it wouldn't work, work with a border. Um, so a joint authority, uh, and we're going all the way down, full incorporation in the Irish state. So those are the eight options uh, on offer. And when they get voted for, if you just look at first preference, and this is what John Curtis uh, so John Curtis keeps doing. He looks at first preferences. Well, first preferences, the Catholics are going to vote for the Irish states, the, the Protestants are going to vote for the British state, and the power-sharing compromise gets hardly any votes at all. But if you come down to the eighth vote, uh, the, the eighth option here, you can see that the Catholics are saying, well, no, we don't want... Sorry, the Protestants are saying, we don't want an Irish state. The Catholics are saying, we don't want a British state. But the, the, the compromise is... They're getting very low uh, percentages, um, so they, they can get through there. Um, as, so that's how that works. But then we found, for conflict resolution, that looking at this first, second, third option doesn't work. What negotiators want to know is if something is really important or desirable or acceptable. And you've heard in the House of Commons lately people talking about what is tolerable, what people can live with. And perhaps they're reading my stuff. And then finally, what's unacceptable? And then when we look at it this way, you get a similar result, but this one, you can see how it's working with the Catholics and the Protestants. Um, the Catholics, uh, 
They really want the Irish state. The Protestants really want the British state. The only thing that can come through, um, and if we go back, you'll see that the lowest figures here for, are for power sharing. Um, power sharing comes through as 27% here, and the, mm, the Protestants can put up with it. And so that's, that's the kind of the thing that came through in the final agreement. Um, so now what's happened with uh, Brexit? I've got eight options here. Uh, the, the people's vote, remain in the EU, the Norway-style deal, the customs union, uh, a compromise deal of some sort, the PM's deal, and the Canada-style Canada deal, um, or no deal at all. So we've got eight options, and uh, we're getting similar kinds of results. And what's interesting, um, and I do leave as a remainers, <clears throat> but the thing is, the government was throwing, uh, have been throwing hundreds of thousands of pounds at research, which looks at the polarization of remainers and leavers. Then they haven't put any money into conflict resolution methods <coughs> like the ones we use in Northern Ireland. So I'm not getting any funding. So I've had to do this using a Google survey technique with a very poor sample, which I paid for myself. Uh, but it is kind of legitimate. And what happens here, if, if I then rank order, and what I can tell you is that I work in places like Syria, Israel, Palestine, and in, where there's a war going on, it's very difficult to get good samples. So I'm used to working with bad samples, and I know how to work with bad samples. And so when, when you rank order these things, you can see here that the Remainers, they would like to have a people's vote, remain in the EU, uh, and so on and so forth, as you would expect. And if you look over there at the Labour Party, they're pretty much the same. The Labour Party and the Remainers are almost on the same page, except Customs Union is a bit higher for Labour Party because that's Labour Party policy. And then for Leavers, they want a Canada-style deal or no deal, and uh, the Conservative are pretty much on the same page as the Leavers. But then if I was doing a conflict resolution, I would look down the two lists and see, well, what's the first item that comes up on both lists? And you can see it's a Norway-style deal is number four, and, no, and it's down here at number four. So if I was looking for a conflict, if this was a fighting war, I would say, hmm, Norway-style deal is something that they could negotiate on and get a deal on. So this is the indicative votes. Uh, this is what's been going on now. Finally, they're doing something interesting after two years of, uh, of wasted, uh, wasted time. And you can see that the customs union is coming up top and the Norway-style deal is floating up there. I'm very sorry it didn't get through, and, uh, but it's, it's not over yet. Um, and so what I should explain here is uh, what I call the politics of peace research. It's, it's, in Northern Ireland, what happened was, first of all, the government said, no, uh, we don't want Colin Irwin running public opinion polls on the peace process in Northern Ireland. That was the view of the British and the Irish government. Um, but then in the, they had a business committee in the negotiations and the business committee of the ten parties elected to negotiate, they said, we overrule the two governments, we want to run our own polling, independent of what the governments are doing. So then the Joseph Rowntree Trust paid for the polling. But this was able to go ahead because the Labour Party and the Conservative Party were on the same page in the House of Commons. So they would allow this to happen. They, there was a cross-party consensus. We just want to get a deal in Northern Ireland. So all of that went ahead. But we're on, in a different situation now here. The, the, the Conservative government part, Party and the Labour Party are not on the same page. So although Joseph Roundtree gave me a quarter of a million quid to run all my stuff 20 years ago, I applied then for funding to run polling on, peace polling on Brexit, but they wouldn't do it. And the reason why they wouldn't do it is because um, they would be sort of pitching one party against another party. That wasn't a problem in Northern Ireland, but it's a problem here. And peace polling and the politics of peace research is kind of like that all over the world. There are interested parties who do want it to happen or don't want it to happen. More often than not, 
don't want it to happen. So um, all the polling that's done is very, very biased. They don't use conflict resolution methodologies as I have illustrated here. Um, and so, but I'm <coughs> hoping that that will change. Um, now suddenly, uh, these guys are talking to each other and uh, maybe if they really want to go down this road, they're going to have to use the conflict resolution research methods that were so successful in Northern Ireland um, if, if they want to bring the public with them and have the public diplomacy campaign that they need. And then if they do that, we might end up like this. With, this is Trimble and Bono and Hume on May 19th, 1998. So we can imagine May, Bernier and Corbyn, you know, maybe they'll, they'll get to the end there and uh, you can imagine the picture or maybe you can't imagine the picture. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, that, that's it. Uh, of course, the other thing that happened in Northern Ireland is to give the, the deal political legitimacy, we had to have a referendum. Unless it was going to be passed by the people, um, it, it, wasn't going to, it wasn't going to stand. So uh, that really is the, the final thing that probably needs to happen, it certainly needs to happen. My job is to just do the conflict resolution. It's, it's up to other people to decide if they want to have a referendum. But in my experience, all over the world, is that when you ask people, do you want to exercise your, your franchise and vote? They generally say yes. So, um, if, 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 they, if they do cut a deal, or if they just take the Prime Minister's deal, and maybe she's playing games, um, if people get asked to, uh, to, uh, to uh, take it to a referendum, my chances are, chances are the public opinion would, so would be yes, take it to a referendum. Okay, that's my thought.